Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Brian Lohr, and I'm the Provincial Assistant for the Office of Mission Advancement for the Congregation of Holy Cross. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Holy Cross Lenten Virtual Retreat entitled A Journey Through the Stations of the Cross. And tonight's presenter is Father Wilfred Raymond, and Father Willie is going to present on the first station, Jesus is Condemned to Die, and the second station, Jesus Takes Up His Cross. And before I bring Father Willie on, I wanted to go through a couple of items with you um, to let you know that these um, are recorded and will be available on our YouTube account. And uh, I also wanted to show you a couple of other things here. Let's see. So if you have any technical difficulties this evening, uh, I would encourage you to contact advancement at holycrossusa.org or 269-240-3175. That's 269-240-3175. And as I mentioned earlier, these presentations will be recorded and made available as a resource, and they'll be you can find those via the Lenten Retreat at HolyCrossUSA.org website. And so one of the other things that I want to encourage you to do is at the bottom of your Zoom screen in the menu bar, there will be an option to submit any questions that you might have as you go as we go through this uh, this retreat. So I would encourage you to do that. It's it's at the end of the um, evening. Father Willie and I will do our very best to answer as many questions as we as we can. And so Father Willie um, and I were talking a little bit earlier. And uh, he has uh, just a great uh, history with the Congregation of Holy Cross. And he spent um, the last 22 years with Holy Cross Family Ministries. He's also been the Director of Residence Life and an Assistant Dean, uh, Director of Campus Ministry at Stonehill, uh, our Holy Cross College in Easton, Massachusetts. And in addition, he served on the boards of, uh, of trustees at King's College and Stonehill College and the board of directors at Holy Cross Family Ministries. He uh, entered the Congregation of Holy Cross in 1964 and earned a bachelor's degree in philosophy from Stonehill College in 1967. And then he went on to Notre Dame to earn a master's in theology in 1971. And he was ordained a priest in the congregation in 1971 as well. He, um, in addition to English, Father Willie is conversant in French and Spanish. He's a native of Old Town, Maine, and is one of 12 children. He's, um, he's a diehard fan of the Boston Red Sox, even though he served as chaplain of the Los Angeles Dodgers for eight years. And he continues to serve on the board of directors of Catholic Athletes for Christ. So I'd like to bring uh, Father Willie on now, and I'll ask him to start start his video. All right. There you go, Father. Good to have you here with us tonight. Great. It's a pleasure to be here, Brian. This is a great a, a great program. I think uh, to have a virtual retreat to begin. Uh, Lent on National Wednesday. It's amazing. It is. It's a it's a great opportunity. And just to give you a sense of the folks uh, that have joined us this evening, and and we're honored to to have them join us, um, uh, to and privileged to journey with them on on this these next forty days of Lent. But we have folks from all over. So your home area of Maine, uh, all the way down to Florida, Texas. Um, Minneapolis, Minnesota, which they're under some weather challenges, mm -hmm. uh, Washington State, California, and even Hawaii. So I think that is just a, a tribute to, um, you know, you great men <laughs> and, and, and the hope that you bring to the world. So we're just uh, excited to kick this off with you. You're our leadoff hitter uh, for the Lent, Lenten retreat, and we're just glad to have you with us. Excellent. Father, would you um, would you open up this Lenten retreat with a prayer, and then I will let you take over from that point. Sure, I'd be happy to. 
And uh, again, I'm delighted to be here with you tonight and uh, uh, to everybody from the great state of Maine all the way to Hawaii and all these in between. Uh, this is a prayer that is in the Congregation of Holy Cross's Directory of Devotional Prayers. It's one of my favorites, too. It's, um, uh, it's O oh Jesus, Living in Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. O oh Jesus, Living in Mary, come and live in your servants, in the spirit of holiness, in the fullness of your power in the perfection of your ways, in the truth of your virtues, in the communion of your mysteries. Rule over every adverse power in your spirit for the glory of the Father. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I like that because it uh, it really uh, introduces us to, to, uh, to the prayers of the Congregation of Holy Cross, the uh, also, the role of Mary in in our in the economy of salvation, and uh, as we um, were on Ash Wednesday, what a wonderful moment to begin! And uh, I would um, I'd just like to um, say about uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. That was kind of a hobby while I was out there at Family Theater Productions, and um, Family Theater was founded by Father Patrick Payton, who Brian he may be the the most well-known alumnus of the University of Notre Dame because yeah. uh, he spoke live all around the world to more than 28 million people in these huge rosary rallies and then he was a major influence in Hollywood from 1947 right up until his death in 1992 and now he's a he's um, a candidate for sainthood very serious he's venerable and we're just waiting for one miracle to be approved for him to be beatified. So I think he would be the first alumnus of the University of Notre Dame to be beatified as well. And we hope a saint someday. Super cool. And uh, while I was out in, in Los Angeles, uh, uh, being a chaplain to the Dodgers was a, was a, a hobby on the side. And, and yet um, some wonderful people, Vince Scully, the voice of the Dodgers, going way back to Brooklyn days. Uh, was the lector at um, most of the masses that we had at the stadium, and even he read the um, the Passion narrative uh, for that uh, during Holy Week, and and I was amazed that he was able to do that, and then because it's long, and then a, a broadcast right afterwards, and the I think the Pirates were in town playing them, and right after he read the. Uh, Right after mass, they they came up and they said, "I've never listened to the gospel as attentively <laughs> as when Vince Scully is reading it." So. Father, I don't think you could find a better lector. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. So, well, thank you for being with us tonight, and I'll let you take over. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Father. This uh, the theme of the of the uh, the retreat is. Uh, the, the a journey with the way of the cross, the stations of the cross. And I uh, just want to mention a couple of things about, about the, uh, the, um, the way of the cross. Uh, it's a, a, a pilgrimage uh, that uh, we embark on. It's a virtual journey to the Holy Land to meet Christ. And I think it's, it's really important to recognize it as a virtual journey. Many of the early Christians either lived in the Holy Land or they journeyed there to encounter Jesus in the, the soil that was made sacred by his birth, his life, and especially by his passion, death, and resurrection. And during the first millennium of Christianity, uh, many Christians traveled freely, even from Europe on pilgrimage. They, for safety, they often journeyed with others and, and had uh, armed guards along with them. Then uh, subsequent invasions by the Persians in the in the sixth century, and and then uh, by um, the uh, Turks and uh, and uh, others out of Arabia, the the Muslims uh, and the various tribes exposed the pilgrims to robbery and kidnappings and even death along the way. So uh, various military and religious orders sprang up to protect the Christians on pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So uh, the Order of Malta, the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre, the, 
the Order of Hospitallers and, and others, were attempts to make it possible for Christians to go to the Holy Land on pilgrimage. Uh, and uh, there were seven or eight uh, crusades, and, and these uh, crusader knights that were called by uh, Pope Urban II to, to come and, and um, recapture uh, Jerusalem, uh, they, they succeeded for about 100 years, a or, or, uh, little more than that. But but then they were uh, they lost the uh, they lost uh, access to uh, the holy places and and it's around that time that uh, Saint Francis of Assisi developed the this devotion to the Stations of the Cross. So it's a, just a very interesting little um, introduction to the to the way of the cross, what we might call a virtual pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Um, each Lent calls us to a personal and communal journey of faith, a pilgrimage in the company of Jesus to the, the great and glorious mountain of Easter. Uh, this Lent, we follow the way of the cross to help us progress from the winter of Ash Wednesday, it's a real winter in Minnesota, I understand, to the springtime of Easter. And uh, in, the, in the first uh, uh, station of the cross, Jesus is condemned to death. In, and by the way, in, in Lent, there, there are really two major um, uh, agenda items. The first half of Lent is an emphasis on uh, fasting and, and almsgiving and um, the moral life and, and trying to improve uh, our uh, our uh, lives as Christians, and by the time we get to the Saturday of the third week of Lent, we realize that all the resolutions we might have made on Ash Wednesday and promises to uh, to do this and to give to the poor and to and to pray daily and to um, and to um, uh, also um, uh, attend. Uh, a daily mass or pray the rosary or uh, other devotions uh, um, we find out by the end of the third week that we've we failed in many of those and and uh, we realize at that point that we cannot do this on our own we, we cannot uh, we cannot make this this journey uh, either alone or even as a group we can't do it perfectly so we need something else so the first half emphasizes the, the ethical life, the, our daily lives. And the second half is an emphasis on encountering Jesus and, and recognizing that he is the source of our help, of the grace that we need to live this life. And so the, the focus in the Gospels especially moves from the uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke to the Gospel of John, which is the Gospel of such intimate uh, knowledge and encounter with uh, with our Lord Jesus Christ. So I, I say that just by way of introduction that the first half of Lent, it's meant to uh, challenge us to to uh, to pray, to give alms and to uh, and and to fast and 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 then the second half is is uh, a recognition that we need we need the help of our Lord Jesus Christ, of God, of the angels and the saints. And, uh, and so um, the Gospel of John uh, takes over. And in the first station of the cross, Jesus is condemned to death. And in St. John's Gospel, some Greeks come seeking Jesus. And he greets them with surprising words. He says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. So he really is saying, okay, this is, you're seeking me. This is who I truly am. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So as a little prayer for that first station, I'd like to um, pause. 
and you can do this in your own in your own way in your own hearts but i i would pray lord help me to discover this lenten season what i still need to let die so that it can bear much fruit in my life so lord help me to discover in this lenten season what i need to let die in my heart in my life so that this lent can bear much fruit in my life that's uh, station one, Jesus is condemned to death. The second, second station is uh, Jesus takes up his cross. The soldiers stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They placed a crown of thorns on his head and a reed in his right hand. They knelt before him and mocked him, crying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him, and they struck him on the head with the reed. They had no idea of the irony of their in jest, calling him Hail, King of the Jews. He is so much more than the King of the Jews. So, again, uh, a, a short prayer. Lord, you willingly underwent humiliation, suffering, and scorn as you took up the cross to fill us with hope. As you carry your cross, you ask us to follow you on this path. Help us to take up the cross and not shun it. Help us to follow the path of love and sacrifice for our family, our friends, and all those in need. One person who can inspire us with hope this Lent is the Holy Mother of the Lord. Like her many, uh, like uh, many of us, uh, like her many of us will stand at the foot of the cross of loved ones. In Constitution 8 of the Congregation of Holy Cross, we have this beautiful, this beautiful description of this scene. There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother Mary, who knew grief and was a lady of sorrows. She is our special patroness, a woman who bore much she could not understand and who stood fast. To her many sons and daughters, whose devotions ought to bring them often to her side, she tells much of this daily cross and its daily hope. So I'd like to just read that again. It's a beautiful citation from uh, Constitution 8 in the Congregation of Holy Cross. There stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother Mary, who knew grief and was a lady of sorrows. She is our special patroness, a woman who bore much she could not understand and who stood fast. To her many sons and daughters, whose devotions ought to bring them often to her side, she tells much of this daily cross and its daily hope. Lord, following your son Jesus and his mother, help us to be men and women with hope to bring this Holy Lent. Amen. Just like to mention that uh, in, in uh, our archives at uh, Family Theater in, in Hollywood, uh, we, we have um, uh, uh, brief uh, interviews that Father Peyton did with a number of celebrities. Uh, and, and one of them was with uh, Mrs. Kennedy, with Rose Kennedy, the mother of the president and, and uh, Bobby Kennedy and, and Senator Ted Kennedy. And um, in this interview, uh, Father Peyton asked a, a, a question that I I was just so surprised that he would even dare to ask this. He said, he said, dear Rose, you're, um, you uh, in your family and as a mother had to suffer through the tragic death of two of your sons. And, and she corrected him and she said, no father, it's three sons because the oldest of her sons, Joe was killed tragically in World War II. And then uh, President Kennedy, in, in uh, November in Dallas in 1963, and then uh, Senator Bobby Kennedy in 1968 in Los Angeles. And, uh, and so he, he said uh, to her, and this is what, 
was uh, very surprising to me. He said, uh, dear Rose, how do you see the will of God at work in this, in, in these tragic deaths of your sons? And, and she said, she paused for quite a while. And then she said, the only way that I could make sense out of this as the will of God was that uh, moment when uh, President Kennedy's body was uh, uh, lying in state in the dome of the Capitol. Uh, she said, I remember the putting my hand on the flag draped coffin and the only way I could get through that tragedy was to remember Our Lady at the foot of the cross when her son was dying and then she took him and laid him in the tomb as well. So uh, she's, a, she's a woman of great faith, obviously, but it's, it was just a, 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 a very poignant uh, recognition that Mary at the foot of the cross uh, is uh, able to give hope to all of, all of us, especially people that are suffering from the tragedy of war in, in, uh, in Ukraine and, and Russia and uh, in, in uh, so many places around the world. So, um, so Lord, following your son Jesus and his mother, help us to be women and men with hope to bring this Holy Lent. Amen. So, uh, Brian, if um, we can, uh, if we can open this up, if, if uh, there are questions or observations people would like to make, or yes, absolutely, Father, and um, we have a, a a couple of questions that have been submitted thus far. Um, the first one is uh, that this individual didn't know that Saint Francis's role in developing what we now call the Stations of the Cross. Can you talk more about that? And do you know where and when the first stations appeared on the walls of, of a church and how it spread throughout the world? Sure. I wish I, I, wish I had that right at my fingertips. But I, I know uh, as he was uh, involved with the, with the, the, uh, the nativity scenes when, uh, uh, you know, when, when people could got, not go to, uh, to the Holy Land anymore because it was just too dangerous and, and um, the, the uh, Crusades really, in the end, um, failed and, and Jerusalem was, um, was no longer a place that uh, Christians could easily visit. Uh, and, and yet Franciscans, um, Franciscans somehow, uh, if you go to the Holy Land today, they have custody of many of the holy sites. And that's because they, um, Francis went to see um, the, uh, I think it was Saladin, and, and uh, tried to convert him. It didn't quite work, but he, but, uh, he did, uh, he, he did uh, trust uh, the Franciscans to come and, and uh, be at the holy sites. Uh, and as, as far as the, the Stations of the Cross, my understanding is that Francis was always looking for, for innovative ways to, to connect the, the faith with the common ordinary um, families and people. So he's, I, I know that he is the one that, uh, that, uh, that popularized the, this virtual journey to the Holy Land, especially to the Via Dolorosa and the, 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 uh, the, the passion and death of the Lord. Yes. Doesn't sound that dissimilar to Father Peyton. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Similar yes. there. Exactly. Um, Father, there's another uh, question here. Is there an interplay between dying to ourselves to bear fruit and surrendering mm -hmm. our will to God? Very good question. Yeah, it really is. I, I, that's, that's uh, excellent. It almost answers itself. I, I still remember Fulton Sheen. Uh, uh, his comment was, every time I go by a hospital, I have this sadness because I know that there's so much pain and suffering going on for many people in, who are in hospitals. And the sadness is that it would be so, it would be so uh, helpful to uh, all of us, to all humanity, if they knew that they could unite their sufferings to the suffering of Christ. 
to make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the salvation of the world. And it's not that Christ could not save everybody he did, but he also allows us to participate in, in uh, bringing hope and salvation to our world by joining, recognizing that our suffering united with his is incredibly powerful. So I, I think uh, the other part of that question was to, uh, it had to do with uh, surrendering your will. Yeah, so it, it was, um, you know, dying to ourselves to bear yes. fruit and surrendering our will to God. Right, right. Yeah, I think I, I think that's just uh, yeah. It, 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 the the person who asked the question it's a beautiful question. It really answers itself that uh, we uh, when we uh, uh, when we can uh, die to ourself. Uh, this I, I think that has to do with what Thomas Aquinas said that to love the other is to will the good of the other as others. So it's to actually be able to put yourself. Uh, uh, in second or third place after after your neighbor in need who needs your love to be to be uh, uh, present and real yes good good father uh next question here is when did jerusalem open back up to the christians and how did that come about uh, that's um i, I think um for for uh, after, after there were seven or eight crusades and and by the way the, the crusades uh because much of the literature in english was about the crusades was written after the uh, was written in english and 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 uh, english uh, after henry the eighth broke with rome and and uh, and the post-reformation period uh, uh even the the Spanish Inquisition, both of those were were demonized as as something evil that was completely evil that was perpetrated by the Catholic Church and and uh, and on um, you know on the poor uh, people of Islam. Obviously, there were there were atrocities. I think on both sides, but the 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 effort of the Crusades was really to make it possible for Christians. To to go unmolested to visit the holy sites and and um, and for a while it was very very difficult but I I think uh, it it gradually opened up because the the uh, the uh, when when uh, Islam uh, had conquered what is now Spain uh, Christians and Jews were second class citizens, but they were tolerated and they were they were given the freedom to practice their religion with, within reason and uh, 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 sometimes in public, but but at least they were free to to do that. The uh, and Islam in 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 the Middle East uh, after Saladin and the defeat of the Crusades, I think was a lot more tolerant than some forms of Islam that we experience today is the, the kind of fundamentalist uh, uh, attitude towards other religions that are not, that are not Islam. So, yeah. And, and there's, um, it's very complicated history. I don't know exactly. I think it, I think it, it was always the case that there was some small uh, Christian communities that remained. I, I remember on a, on a um, pilgrimage to the Holy Land, we had a a, um, a bibli biblical archaeologist who was Palestinian, and his home parish was the Church of the Annunciation in Nazareth. Mm. And he said, "You have to understand, people uh, will question, like, is this is this really where the angel appeared to Mary and announced that she's to be the mother of God?" And and he said, "You know." Uh, they raise questions about this, but you have to remember that these these were destroyed by the Persians. They were destroyed by the Muslims. They were destroyed by the Turks. But whenever they had a chance, the small Christian community would act and they would build a church on that very spot. They knew where it was. And so he said, as far as we know, this is exactly where it is. The Holy Sepulchre, that's where Jesus was uh, laid to rest in the tomb. 
That's mm-hmm. where he was crucified on Mount Calvary. So uh, those, um, I don't think it was ever the case that Christians were completely expelled or, or eliminated, but their lives were, were very difficult. And, and for many, for many centuries, um, certainly, certainly after, uh, uh, you know, after the, the um, 1492 and, and uh, changes in, uh, in Europe, Europe that led to this uh, expansion of uh, France and England and, you know, going out around the world colonizing and uh, look, we we look now, and it's you know it's a complicated history. But uh, it, then they made it. They made it. They secured the the places where Christians could come and visit, even though the great majority of people are are Muslim and and Jewish in the in those uh, sites in Palestine and Israel today. Right. Okay. Great. And Father, um, you talked earlier about the two stages of Lent and. Yes. You mentioned kind of the the early stage of being the 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 daily lives uh, that we have. Um, the stage of us doing our best to follow our Lenten resolutions, and the stage of us realizing that we can't do it alone. Do you have any recommendations uh, on books or articles that speak to this that will help us with our own Lenten journeys? Uh, sure. Um... Wow, <laughs> that is so good. <laughs> um, you know, just just to uh, to go back to that for a moment, the the uh, this comes from the, from uh, post Vatican II uh, and the and the recovery of the the uh, order of Christian initiation of adults, okay. and and uh, and and it this goes way back to uh, the the early church when. When um, adults wanted to become Christian, they had to go through a, a lengthy process as catechumens, and um, and, um, and and so we have the right now we have this this whole right of election of um, uh, with the scrutinies and all of that. It's a, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing, and it's meant it's meant to um, introduce someone who is a neophyte into into the faith. Take that person by the hand and gradually introduce them to the to the Christian faith, to the creed, to what we believe, to how we live that belief as the moral life, and how we celebrate that in the sacraments and the Eucharist, and how we pray. So, if you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, I, I would say right now, after the Gospels, that is the best resource that that you could go to. It is just. And there's a place on on Halo, the the app that a lot of people are are using right now. The catechism in a year, you can also do the Bible in a year with Father, this remarkable uh, young priest from Duluth, Minnesota, Father, uh, is it Michael Schmitz? Michael Schmitz, yeah. And they're they're also doing the Imitation of Christ with uh, Jim Caviezel and Jonathan Rumi. Yes. But one of the things that happened to me out in in Los Angeles is that I got to know three Jesuses that the Jim Caviezel who starred in the passion of the Christ right. got to know and became a friend. And, uh, and, and Jonathan Rumi was a young man in, uh, at, at uh, good shepherd church in Beverly Hills, working with the entertainment fellowship. And he used to come to family theater. Uh, once a month we had an open house and we'd have, uh, it's called prayer and pasta. So it's some form of prayer, usually adoration, a holy hour, and then a past pasta meal. And then we'd have someone from the uh, from the entertainment industry that would that would uh, speak to them about some issue that that was uh, important to uh, to share. So Jonathan Rumi was used to come to family theater, and now he's Jesus in the Chosen, that wonderful series that's in the third year now with episodes. So I'm sure a lot of people listening have heard of that. Yeah. Um, I, w- I would uh, I would highly recommend that as well. It's just uh, it's a wonderful way to get to know the uh, Jesus, but also the relationship with the apostles and the women that that um, were part of part of the entourage uh, in the in uh, in the life of Jesus in his public ministry. Yes, good. Well, Father, you you opened up the door to talk a little bit about Hallow, so. Um, 
the the founder of Hallow it happens to be Alex Jones, yes. who is um, my son-in-law. Uh, so he he married my second eldest daughter, Megan, and he and three Notre Dame guys started started this app Hallow, and and it's just a beautiful um, uh, uh, prayer app, and and um, well, people are doing amazing <laughs> amazing things. They're they're doing the imitation of Christ. It just starts today. Yes, uh, with yeah. uh, Jim Caviezel, Jonathan Rumi, and. I think a couple of other people, but they're the two main, the two main persons. And I, Jim was telling me uh, just a, about a month ago, he said, I've been working on this project for Hello. And he, he's, and he takes the craft of acting so seriously. He said, yeah. at the end of the day, I'm drenched with, with perspiration from like the intensity of this, it's like, like the imitation of Christ. So that's, you know, in answer to that question, what's a good, uh, what's a good tool? Even though it's 600 years old, the imitation of Christ as a as a way to meditate each day during mm-hmm. Lent, it's wonderful. Yes, yeah, awesome. Thank you, Father. So this this next question is really cool. Um, what's the trick to willingly take up our own crosses? Mm. <laughs> How about that, Father? <laughs> Well, wow, that's that's uh, soul searching. <laughs> it's like, yeah. So, Father, talk talk a little bit about you know the congregation of Holy Cross is the the cross is the only way, and we right. anchor ourselves to the cross. So, tell, talk a little bit about that willingness to take up those crosses, mm-hmm. and how we should look at those as blessings, and and not burdens. Yes, that's. Uh, thank you for framing it that way. That's um, n- number one. I don't think any of us uh, look for um, for burdens or crosses to take on, but we we all get our share in in our lives. We can we can uh, pretend that uh, they're not there. We can refuse to face them, face reality. But the healthiest um, the healthiest way to be a a person of joy, and and uh, and and, uh, and also to be happy, healthy, and holy is is to embrace the cross when it comes, because it always, when it's embraced and lived, it really does uh, fill us with joy, and it, and it's a joy that is based on hope that um, that comes from uh, from our Lord Himself. Uh, one of the one of the best quotes um, that uh, I've heard, uh, in it, and and I heard this uh, in in Cologne, Germany, in World Youth Day in two thousand five, right after Benedict was elected pope. He right. he he said um, he said this to these young people, like several several million young people gathered for World Youth Day. He said, only where God is seen does life truly begin. It's beautiful. Only when we meet the living God in Christ do we know what life is. We are not some casual and meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed. Each of us is loved by God. Each of us is necessary. There is nothing more beautiful than to be surprised by the gospel, by the encounter with Christ. And there is nothing more beautiful than to know him and to speak to others of our friendship with him. That's uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, And I, I share that just because I, I think to know Christ is also to know his cross and to know the resurrection that the cross fills us with hope because we know in the end he triumphs yes. and life triumphs over death goodness over sin and evil and that triumph occurs at easter it does yes the great the great mountain and i think that's why the, it's, the structure of lent is brilliant in 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 my mind spiritually because it it allows us to to um, recognize it, the word they use in the ordo is compunction that that um it punctures our ego our thought that we can we can do this on our own because we fail over and over again. 
<laughs> but then when we surrender to our Lord and and uh, take up the cross that that he blesses us with, then then we can experience his grace and the joy that comes from that and, and, and the sure hope of the resurrection. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And Father, um, let's see if we have a couple of more questions here. Um, so one of the questions here is, did St. Francis develop the 14 stations and was he also the one who introduced the Stations of the Cross during Fridays of Lent? So kind of a technical question. Oh, yeah, that's, and I, I'm not an expert on that, so I, I can't really pretend to give a full answer. I just know that um, it it began to evolve, and I and and in so many uh, churches in Europe, and then and then Catholic churches around the world. It just be it became part of devotional life to have the Stations of the Cross in in the church, I, uh, in, in, in the church building itself. Uh, you know, I was, I was at, uh, in India just a month ago and uh, in Kerala, which was evangelized by, by Thomas the apostle. Uh, we celebrated mass one day in a, in a church that was uh, built in the year 52 AD. Mm, wow. So it's before St. Peter's in Rome and St. John Lateran and all those big basilicas and, uh, and and um, that church was St. Mary's. And in that church, there was this precious relic, and it was a relic of a cross that belonged to uh, to Thomas the Apostle. And and this little cross had been uh, desecrated by by fanatics in the area because there there were this was just the beginning of Christianity hmm. in, in India. Uh, and and um, they after desecrating it, they tossed it into the lake and it's it it floated across the lake to this little island where there's a chapel today and some women were were uh, with with sickles were cutting the uh, the grass and the uh, and the rice and uh, the rice pa- in the rice paddies and and they struck one of them struck the cross and and it started oozing bleeding mm-hmm. blood from the cross so they took it and they brought it to the um, this um, pagan leader, and and uh, and eventually it was returned to the few Christians that were there, and they they have kept it now. Here it is two uh, two thousand years later. Wow! And wow. It's, it's just a, it was a, an amazing moment. But it's that was the cross um, of Thomas the Apostle, doubting Thomas, who was the first one, in spite of his doubts and his suffering. He's the first. Uh, he he gives the fullest expression of the faith in all the four gospels when he kneels down and he says, my Lord and my God. That was the first time in the gospels other than Jesus himself saying he is, he is our Lord and he is God. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how I got off on that, but yeah. in, in any case, it was the, the, the cross, the cross obviously is central to our faith. It's certainly in the congregation of Holy cross. It's, it's always there. And, uh, yeah, and you know, let's talk just a smidge about that. So the the motto of the Holy Cross is "Hail the Cross, our only hope." Yes. How did that come about? Sure, that's that. Um, it, it would be nice if we could copyright it, but we we can't because it it predated uh, it predated uh, um, uh, the founding of Holy Cross. But it, you know, the new bishop in in um, look in uh, Saint Cloud, Minnesota. Pat Neary, who is Father Pat Neary, who's just ordained said, last week or the week yes. before. Yes. Uh, that's his motto, too. Mm-hmm. Ave crux bez unica. Hail the cross, our only hope. And I, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, Father uh, Father Moreau, the founder of Holy Cross, blessed, blessed Moreau, mm-hmm. he uh, he took that up and, and, and it's almost an accident because uh, he his um, his community of uh, priests that he developed, and then they were joined to the brothers of Holy Cross, the brothers of Saint Joseph, who became Holy Cross brothers. Uh, they were from a suburb of Le Mans that is called Saint Croix Holy Cross, and so we're not the uh, we're not the congregation of the Holy Cross. We are the congregation 
of Holy Cross from from that suburb from uh, but but it's it's uh, providential because that that uh, became the the central the central icon for the congregation of Holy Cross when we're when we're when we take final vows we get we get a cross and we have a cross and anchor and we have the symbol uh, which you have on your shirt is yes we have two anchors and it's double we want to make sure that they know that the cross really is our only hope yes excellent excellent good well father i think we've answered all of the questions uh for this evening but what i'd like to ask if you don't mind is to lead us in a in a closing prayer this evening and then i will uh, after that i will introduce uh next week's uh present as well Excellent. so well thank you again uh, before the closing prayer i just want to thank uh you for uh, uh inviting me and and thank everybody who's participated tonight and as uh, i hope you have a blessed and fruitful lent and uh as we um as we conclude, let us uh, do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all of your blessings. Thank you especially for the gift of our faith, the, the, the best gift that you've given us, which is includes the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, the gift of uh, the Holy Spirit who continues to pour out love and strength and blessings upon our world and the gift of the mother of your son and we we thank you for the many ways in which you bless us in our families in our parents in our children in uh, our friends and the 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 uh, the the hope that you give us we ask you to continue to bless us and and help us to embrace the crosses that come our way um, to, to do so we know often they're difficult to to accept and to begin with but they always lead us to a deeper love for you and for each other we ask you to uh, to uh, continue to bless each of the persons who are participating in this retreat this virtual retreat and um, and keep them safe and and uh, during during the storms of life during the crosses that come their way that they will not lose hope but always always turn to you our good God we thank you we praise you we glorify you and we bless you and we ask you that you would continue to bless all of us we pray this through Jesus Christ your Son and our Lord Amen. In the Amen. Name of with the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Father, thank you for joining us and for leading us off. And uh, I wish you uh, a great Lent. And uh, and we'll see you Easter. All right. <laughs> okay, well, Father. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, thank you. And I also wanted to let you know uh, that we will be reconvening on Sunday. So this this Sunday, um, not next Sunday, this Sunday, but Father Neil Walk is going to be with us on Sunday, February 26th, and he's going to present on the third station, Jesus Falls for the First Time, and then the fourth station, Jesus Meets His Sorrowful Mother. And so thank you for joining us this evening, and uh, I hope all of you will continue to to join us on this Lenten journey. And thank you for, for being with us this evening. Take care and have a great evening. Night. Good night.